It's very important to define what is a relapse in chronic phase CML. In, in most cases, um, especially the patient is being closely monitored either by his local community physician or by um, leukemia expert and academic physician, uh, the frequent way we will find a relapse is a molecular relapse. So, so we will see a patient who has been on a tyrosine kinase inhibitor many times for years, who has been on routine surveillance every six months or every year, uh, who now starts having a rise in his transcript that is confirmed on two subsequent readings. And that usually will be the initiating factor that makes us shift um, our treatment to start considering another TKI. And we will also do molecular testing to look for secondary resistant mutations at that time. Um, in that case, usually when we find that the patient is progressing and he does not have any resistant mutations, we would choose if he were on one of the secondary generation TKIs, the other one, for example, if he were on nilotinib, we would consider switching to dasatinib or bosutinib. If he were on dasatinib, then, you know, vice versa. Uh, the other t form of relapse that we rarely see, and this happens quite frequently, especially in patients who have uh, become non-compliant or poorly compliant, is that uh, they may have been taking a tyrosine kinase inhibitor for a few years, and then they either stopped it or didn't come for follow-ups or were taking it, uh, very erratically is that they will come in with a blast phase or an accelerated phase of the chronic myeloid leukemia. In those cases, um, the outcome is much poorer and the overall survival for blast phase uh, CML or for AML from an underlying CML is uh, less than about 20-25% at one year. Uh, in general, for those patients, we usually will use high-dose chemotherapy or hypomethylator-based combinations with a second-generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor. We do have a study of decidabine in combination with desatinib for patients who have a blast phase or a AML arising from a prior chronic phase CML, and it has shown encouraging response rates of about 60 to 70 percent. Uh, however, the survival data at this time is not uh, completely matured. So depending on the type of relapse, we would choose either uh, another second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor, in some cases maybe a third generation, especially if that patient happens to have a T315I mutation, or we may go to a combination approach with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor plus either hypomethylator therapy or chemotherapy uh, if that patient has a full-blown relapse with a uh, accelerated or blast phase CML. In general, uh, we have seen that in patients who were on a first-generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor, so let's say on imatinib, and achieved a major molecular remission, uh, and uh, they lost that major molecular remission at some point, uh, either due to compliance or due to acquisition of resistance. When we challenge those patients with a second-generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor, whether it's dasatinib or nilotinib or bosutinib, uh, the chances of achieving response are still very high, usually above 70, 80 percent to get them into major molecular response. Now, when we have had the patient already on a second-generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor and they start acquiring resistance and we're switching to another second-generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor, the uh, achievement in major molecular response is slightly lower, somewhere in the ranges of 50 to 70 percent. Um, and once the patients have had two second-generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors, so let's say they were on dasatinib for a while, then started having an increase in their transcript and we switched them to nilotinib, then they had a response maybe for a while, and then they started acquiring resistance, uh, and then they did not have a T315I, and if I put them on ponatinib, for example, at that time, uh, the response rates with ponatinib are about 40%, which is uh, very favorable to what we would have got by switching them to a another third, um, a second generation TKI, such as uh, bosutinib. So the bottom line is that even in patients who have failed two or three tyrosine kinase inhibitors, we can get them back into major molecular response in anywhere between 35 to 50, 55 percent. Um, but in general, those are not very durable, and that's when we start considering other modalities, such as adding on therapies that may enhance the activity of tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and some of these drugs include agents such as interferon alpha, uh, JAK inhibitors, maybe immune checkpoint-based therapies, or even consideration of transplant if they have indeed failed three or more tyrosine kinase inhibitors. The DESTINY trial looked at patients who were being treated with either imatinib, nilotinib, or dasatinib and had achieved an MMR and maintained that for a minimum of a year, and then dose reduced their TKI by 50% and kept them on that 50% dose reduction for a total of 12 months. What they found with this study is that in those patients who had MR 4.0, only about 
I think it was two and a half percent of patients had what they defined or what they called a molecular relapse with the dose reduction. So very few patients had a molecular relapse with dose reduction of their TKI if they went into it with an MR 4.0 or better. In the patients who had a response somewhere between MMR and MR 4.0, it was still only 18% of patients who had a molecular relapse, meaning again, loss of MMR. So what this is, is telling us is that once patients have a sustained relatively deep molecular response, it is possible to lower the dose of their TKI. And they found that TKI-related side effects improve significantly with dose reductions. In those patients who had a molecular relapse after the dose reduction, all of those patients regained their prior response when the dose was increased back to their, to their initial starting dose. So again, there doesn't seem to be a huge negative side to attempting to lower the dose um, as we may improve toxicity and patients may maintain their same level of response and continue to do quite well. I suppose this data could suggest that in, in some patients we are over treating them by continuing to treat them with the standard doses of these TKIs given that this data suggests that even in, in those patients who have a response between MMR and MR 4.0, less than 20% of them are going to relapse if you dose reduce. So certainly there are patients who will do just fine with a lower dose and don't need to be treated at the standard doses for long-term therapy. The hard part is I don't know that we know which patients are which when we go into this. So if we're gonna start thinking about dose reducing in these patients who have sustained deep molecular responses, we need to be sure that we're monitoring them very closely so we can catch it early if they do start to relapse. The question if uh, treatment discontinuation can be done in a second attempt is being recently uh, addressed by an abstract um, reported in the last ASH. In this abstract, these uh, authors tried to see what was the rate of discontinuation after first failure of discontinuation. Very interestingly, those authors, they show a significantly high percentage of patients, around 40%, who were able to successful discontinuation. However, it's a very important caveat to really discuss in this trial. And the caveat is the following. Initial French trials that they start to do discontinuation trials, they really fix the threshold to really restart the drug once patient has any detectable disease. They say that patient has a complete molecular response and the patient has any detectable disease, patients will really start again on therapy. So in this uh, initial kind of uh, threshold was changed in the subsequent trials. And we know these days that even um, early detection of very small detection of this uh, transcript is not a really a sign of relapse if the patient doesn't really lose uh, the, doesn't lose the, the MMR. So if you really look at this trial, it's very interesting that, you know, this 40% may be the patients who really belong to this category of patient who really in the first time they were really placed back on the drug because they have some levels. However, if you let them go, and those, many of those patients, because the sensitivity of the PCR technique, they may be successfully discontinued because they will never really, uh, really increase the, the PCR above 0.1%. So it's an important point that tell us that, again, the threshold of MMR is an important um, threshold of time point that you, we should consider at the time to reintroduce the TKI.